As human beings, we rely on language to communicate our ideas, desires and concerns to other people. But are languages merely tools for expressing our thoughts, or do they actually shape the way we think and the way we perceive the world? In this video, we will explore in depth this question, so if you're searching for answers, stay tuned. The hypothesis that our mental activity is at least to some extent relative to and dependent on the language that we speak is called the linguistic relativity hypothesis. It's often associated with the names of Benjamin Lee Whorf and his mentor, Edward Sapir, and is commonly referred to as the sapir whorf hypothesis. Sapir and Whorf were by no means the initiators of this idea, but were the ones that brought a lot of attention to it. Sapir's presumption was that languages differ in the way they structure reality, but the hypothesis that language shapes thought was not fully developed until the works of Benjamin Whorf. After studying the Hopi language, Whorf came to the conclusion that structural characteristics of the Hopi differ widely from the structure of what he called the standard average European languages – English, French, German. For example, Hopi grammatical categories provide process orientation toward the world, whereas the categories in SAE give a fixed orientation toward time and space. Whorf strongly believed that these differences lead speakers of Hopi and SAE to view the world differently. The Whorf in view has been a subject of criticism ever since it was first formulated. One problem pointed out by the critics is Worf's lack of empirical support for his linguistic insights. Another is that Worf formulated his hypothesis in general terms, and a hypothesis cannot be correctly evaluated unless it's precisely stated. The sapir worf hypothesis has received a number of different formulations over the years, and nowadays is known in two versions, the strong hypothesis, also known as linguistic determinism, and the weak hypothesis, or linguistic relativity. It is necessary to clarify that the words strong and weak are not related to the strength of the scientific argumentation, but rather to the degree to which language is assumed to influence our thoughts and behavior. According to the strong version, we perceive only what our language allows us to. Such version would suggest that we are figuratively slaves to the words available to us. Although the strong deterministic hypothesis is frequently referred to as the Worfian view, it's not quite clear how strong Worf thought the relationship between the two variables was. The possibility of linguistic determinism has been explored by a variety of authors, mostly in science fiction. The most recent example is the Oscar-winning movie Arrival. Don't worry, there will be no spoilers. For those who haven't watched it yet, Arrival is an alien movie. But it's not just another alien movie in which the whole human race unites against the evil extraterrestrials. Under that sci-fi plotline is a movie that forces the viewer to reconsider what makes us human. A movie about communication and most of all about the days in which it breaks down and fear of the unknown sets in. As promised, we will not spoil the plotline. The only thing that we should mark is that the movie is clearly on board with the linguistic determinism. That leads to the question, are we slaves to the language we speak? Maybe most of you who are watching have clicked on this video searching for answer on this exact question. And here's your answer. The strong hypothesis has long been abandoned by the scientists. One effective argument against the deterministic view is the work on color perception demonstrating that the Dani, a tribe in New Guinea, he had little trouble learning the English set of color categories, despite having only two words for colors in their language. Yet another problem with the strong view is that linguistic concepts are highly translatable in different languages. Under linguistic determinism, a concept in one language would not be understood in a different language because the speakers and their worldviews are bound by different sets of rules. Languages are in fact translatable and only in select cases the ideas could be lost in translation. Although the deterministic view has been rejected, the empirical research on the topic confirms a milder influence of language on thought, or the weak version. According to the weak version, the language does influence our mental processes to some extent, but it does not fully determine the way we view the world and the way we think. Many early studies took color as a starting point, literally evaluating how speakers see the world when filtering their perceptions through specific categories for colors in different languages. Look at these two squares for a second, do you notice the difference? What do you call these colors in your native tongue? Share your thoughts in the comments below. This example is a part of an experiment that studied the difference between English and Russian native speakers' perception of the blue color spectrum. Unlike English, Russian makes an obligatory distinction between light blue, gala boy and dark blue cine. This raised the question whether this linguistic difference leads to differences in color discrimination. English and Russian speakers were tested in a color discrimination task in which 20 color stimuli from the Russian cine gala boy spectrum were used. Subjects were shown colors arranged in a triad. Their task was to indicate as quickly and accurately as possible which of the two bottom color squares was identical to the top square. The results show that Russian speakers were faster to discriminate two colors when they fell into different linguistic categories in Russian, one Sini and the other Galaboy, than when they were from the same linguistic category, both Sini or both Galaboy. English speakers tested on the same stimuli did not show such an advantage in any of the conditions. 
These results confirm the hypothesis that language affects performance at least on simple perceptual color tasks. To examine the idea of linguistic relativity even further, let's throw to the western edge of Cape York where the Pomparo, a small Aboriginal community lives. These people talk about space in a different way than most of us. Instead of using words like right, left, forward and back, which are commonly used in English, the Cook Tayora speakers use cardinal direction terms north, south, east and west to define space. Actually, everything in the language is arranged in relation to these cardinal directions, so it's pretty normal to say things like there's an ant on your southeast leg, or move the cup to the north, northwest a little bit. One obvious consequence of speaking such a language is that you have to stay oriented at all time, or else you cannot speak properly. The result is a profound difference in navigational ability. Speakers of languages like Cook Tayori are much better than English speakers staying oriented, even in unfamiliar landscapes or inside unfamiliar buildings. But since their spatial knowledge is completely different, how would they think about time then? To examine this question, Lira Boroditsky, a researcher in the field of cognitive science, conducted an experiment in which the subjects were given sets of pictures that represented some kind of temporal progression. Their task was to arrange the shuffled photos to show the correct temporal order. For example, one set would have a picture of a whole banana and then another picture where the banana has been slightly peeled, another picture where a bite has been taken and then finally a picture of the empty banana skin. If you ask English speakers to do this, they will arrange the card so the time proceeds from left to right. Hebrew speakers, on the other hand, tend to arrange the cards from right to left, indicating that writing direction in a language plays a role in time perception. The Cook Theory used a completely different strategy. Instead of arranging the cards from left to right or the other way around, they arranged it from east to west. So when they were facing south, the cards were placed like the cards of the English speakers. When they were facing north, the cards were arranged like the cards of the Hebrew speakers. When they faced west, like our body in the picture, the cards went from their body to the west. So the Cook Theory not only knew what direction they were facing at every single moment, but they also used this spatial orientation to construct their representation of time. People's ideas of time differ across other languages as well. English speakers tend to talk about time in horizontal spatial metaphors. The best is ahead of us or the worst is behind us, while Mandarin speakers who use front-back spatial metaphors for time as well also systematically use vertical metaphors. For example, the next month is the down month and the last month is the up month. So, do Mandarin speakers think about time vertically more often than English speakers do? Imagine that someone standing next to you points to a spot in space directly in front of you and asks, if this spot here is today, where would you put yesterday? And where would you put tomorrow? When English speakers are asked to do this, they nearly always point horizontally, but Mandarin speakers often point vertically, about 7 or 8 times more often than English speakers do. The empirical data shows that native English and native Mandarin speakers do think differently about time. This was true even though both groups were tested in English. The fact that language plays a role in modifying our perception, in shaping our thought and in creating reality is undeniable. So far, the scientific research shows that the language we speak influences the ease with which we discriminate things through the richness of the categories it contains. In this video, we have described how language shapes the way we think about colors, space and time. Other interesting studies have found effects of language on how people construe events, keep track of numbers, perceive concepts, choose to take risks and even how they experience emotion. Share with us in the comments below if you'd like to see another video with more research on the topic. We would love to hear your thoughts on the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis and on the video as well. If you liked the video, share with friends and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!